Hello, Mark Ladwig here. Um, today I'm going to talk about Odysseus, the epic myth of the hero, a book I wrote about 10 years ago. It's hard to believe the passage of time sometimes, but here's the cover. Sing about that long lost man for me. Now, uh, purpose of this video is to announce that I'm going to read this aloud and I'm going to post it in installments uh, on my YouTube page and on my uh, Facebook page, other places later perhaps, but th those two places to start. And um, I'm going to keep the video links. It's, you know, about 30, I think, maybe, maybe a few less than that. And I'm trying to keep them under about 10 minutes. One got to be 25. I thought that's too long, but I thought I'm not going to do it again either. So, uh, anyway, so that's that's the purpose I'm going to exp and, and now I'm going to try to explain a little bit about uh, you know why I did what I did. Uh, I I often get I always have my whole life. Uh, what's a grown man like you got to do with mythology? Uh, there's a common misconception that it's for children. I mean, we we know not. I mean, there was Joseph Campbell in the '80s in his show, and everybody loved those shows most everybody and uh boy i sure did i watched them over and over and over again and uh so but it, it often is you know considered to be a thing for children more than for adults which i disagree with um it, but you know to try to explain it beyond that it, it, i don't know if you can explain true love it's a mystery as much to uh myself as i guess to others I just get to the point. To me, it's like, uh, why do you like this particular food? Why It's sweet. Well, what, what do you mean sweet? Just get to the point you can't explain it any further than that. Or, you know, why do you like uh, one version? Why do you like uh, Red Rector as a mandolinist better than Sam Bush, for instance? Sometimes you just, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, so I, I'm trying to bring this into, you know, why I still like this thing uh, as much as I do, mythology. Um, I'm not trying to treat it trivially. I, I, I really have expanded as a human being, being uh, interested in mythology. It's the wellspring of ideas. It's uh, caused me to uh, examine myself and search for a soul inside this uh, body of mine. And uh, it's made me uh, uh, search after divinity. I think it does all the things it's supposed to do. It makes you makes you uh, put you on the path of the right questions in life. On and on. Uh, kids love it unabashedly. I taught for a long time. Never met anybody who didn't like mythology. Okay, they may say it just to just to tweak my nose in class, but not deep down. They all love it. And uh, a bit sort of, uh, adults seem to be a bit more shy about that. Um, all kids are interested in, mytho in, in uh, uh, Odysseus. Odysseus is somebody like, hey, and adults too. A lot of, a lot of adults I know, though, oh, I never read anything in school, but I read the Odyssey and I loved it. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, there's a lot of people that have that experience. So, um, okay, how did I, how did I, come to write this thing? Well, I was living in Cambria, California, Pines by the Sea, on the central coast of California. It's beyond lovely, just a little south of Big Sur, Hearst Castle, uh, Henry Miller country, Robinson Jefferson country up in uh, Big Sur. You know, it's mighty fine. You're lucky to live on the central coast. And I was teaching at Coast Union High School. I was raising my kids in town. And, uh, but one day I woke up and I thought, hey, doggone it, the kids are going to have to leave here. They're going to leave us here behind and made me sad. So I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe that, that'll be a time that I'll move on to. And I thought, well, what am I going to do? And I thought, well, it'd be time, maybe time to go back and get a, an advanced degree. And I would probably get it in uh, classics, which requires Greek and Latin. Latin, I think, is easier than Greek. Greek requires more work. So I thought, well, I'll go to work on Greek here. Uh, I had monkeyed with it since I was a kid, but you know, I have no facility and at the end of all my studies, my facility is still pretty sorry by classic standards, you know, uh, professors in uh, universities. Uh, but I can muddle along if I have a dictionary and a grammar book and I'm patient. 
uh, being a football player and playing in the line made me a stubborn, patient person. And uh, yeah, I can put my nose to the grindstone if I want it. And I, I think uh, my experience as a lineman doing that. Uh, okay, but I don't want to make it out to be as that it was so hard either, because actually when I delved into it, there's plenty of resources. And so I got first uh, a Loeb Leopold Odyssey. Uh, they're published by Harvard Press. They're green. They're little they're pocketbook size. They're very cool books. They have a cool paper cover, and I thought, oh, I don't want to rip it. So, librarian was kind enough to uh, at Coast Union uh, to uh, put a plastic li library style binding on it. So I felt like it was invincible. And for a couple of years, that book went everywhere with me. And I was trying to learn to read it out loud. And so I spent some time reading it out loud just to get the rhythm, to get the feel, to get the, uh, you know, I could look at the English. I could start to put the endings of the nouns and the verbs and everything together and try to get a feel of how you did it in English, how you did it in Greek, uh, dactylic hexameter. And then I thought, okay, but I got to a point and I thought, well, I, I need a little bit more. I want to I wanna go deeper into my understanding. I found the Perseus website. Um, hosted by Tuft University back in Boston, Tufts, and uh, really wonderful. So I took and I printed out entirety of book four of the Iliad with spaces in Greek, and then I was able to go back and every single word is highlighted, and I looked up every single word. This sounds like an arduous task, and I guess it would be for some. Uh, again, I'll relay, I'll, I will refer to my football experience. Uh, made a very persistent person out of me when I'm going for something I love and, and I, I understand and appreciate the persistence required to uh, get to the end of a long hard task and uh, so I wasn't daunted once I started and then once I started I found there's lots of help and it really wasn't so bad okay so I got to a point and I uh, uh, once I had this printed out in Greek and I had gone through on the computer and I had all the the, the uh, uh, definitions in there. So I knew the definitions of all the words and uh, where appropriate, the parts of speech. Then I started taking this all outside and sitting on the deck early in the morning and got there with a cup of coffee and if I had enough time, and I'm kind of an early riser, right? if, if there's enough time I'd build a little fire, so I'd have a fire, coffee, I, I was sitting at an, under an umbrella and uh, uh, I'd write in pencil on blue line paper and I first I wrote out the Greek, okay, because I need practice in my script, uh, Cyrillic alphabet is different, it's very flowing, it's very beautiful but I'm no hand at it, and I'm still not. Uh, but I wanted to, you know, work at it, so I, I, I printed out entirely uh, the book, and I left, I think, two or three spaces underneath, and that's where I started to work my translations of it. And uh, I did this all out, like I say, outside on my deck, and and uh, it was very cool, fresh air. I'm close to the ocean. I could hear the ocean sometimes. Um, uh, it's just quite an experience. Surrounded by pine trees. Very, very wonderful outside. And, um, okay, but why, and, now, and I think I need to address why I picked book four of the Odyssey. Um, okay. Um, and I guess, I guess uh, you know, I picked book four of the Odyssey because it's his first appearance in the Odyssey. The first three books deal with uh, Telemachus and Penelope back home with the suitors, his son Telemachus, and uh, the upshot of which uh, Telemachus is angry and goes off and visits uh, Nestor, who lives in Pylos, which is across, just, just a little bit uh, southeast down the Ionian Sea on in uh, Pylos, and uh, wants to go and ask, inquire after his father, if anybody knows where Odysseus is, and he goes because he's in dire straits, the suitors for his mother's hand want to kill him, he wants to kill them, things are coming to an ugly head back on Ithaca, and it would be great if Odysseus could show up and if anybody had any word of him. So, you know, um, Telemachus is off on that adventure. So then, then we go to Odysseus on Calypso's Isle, and that's where he first appears. So I thought, well, that's where I'll, ah, that's what I'll work on. 
And then again, uh, you know, I had to ask myself, well, you know, uh, later, of course. I mean, then I didn't have to do it. But now, I guess to, to help you guys understand why, why I'm attracted to Odysseus. Uh, why him in particular? Um, well, I guess I, I have to admit that I, I have a tremendous interest in origins. And the Odyssey is one of the foundational. It's uh, the second book in our literature, Western literature. So it's foundation for our literature in all European languages. And uh, I'll, I'll just say, I guess, you know, perhaps it's the way I was parented that makes me very interested in origins. I think I'll leave it at that, though. Um, okay, uh, here we go. It might just seem a, 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 an exercise in antiquarian studies to do anything with Odysseus these days. Uh, in my opinion, this is uh, incorrect. Uh, I think he's the most modern hero uh, in literature. He still is. He started off modern, and he continues to be modern. Requires me to attempt to justify why I say these things. Because he lived, you know, getting on 3,000 years ago. He's still modern in psyche, in spirit, especially in uh, for the Western man. Okay, people in the West. He's utterly modern. Uh, we're still going to catch up to him. I guess first off, because he's so skeptical. Okay, he's skeptical. Odysseus doesn't win his win through his adventures with brawn, strength like Hercules did. He just bash it, bash it for down, kill something. He wins. No, Odysseus has got to think it through. He's got to cheat. Uh, he's a surprising character. There's very few things that he won't stoop to to survive and win. And uh, uh, but he's clever. He thinks he's, he's got. He gets through with thought. Okay, this is more modern, uh, but he's also extremely skeptical, which is the key. That's the hallmark of the scientific mind: is to be skeptical. It's hard to be skeptical. Um, there's a great honor in skepticism if it's done correctly. If it's done with honesty, uh, it's uh, it's the basis of scientific thought. Uh, Odysseus is a paragon of skeptical thought. And he's clever. But then there's this other thing. Uh, he's decentered from home. Okay? And I think that's something that all modern civilized people, excuse me, are, there's a certain decenteredness. There's a, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, an angst that we're not quite where we should be or where we're supposed to be or what it's, how it's supposed to be. It's deep in us. It's in our society. It's in virtually every Western culture. I think it's becoming more and more. It's really international, too. This is why Odysseus is popular everywhere. I think all people feel this way. Uh, perhaps just a natural part of the human condition. Um, another thing I liked about Odysseus is yeah, he's, a, he's a complete character. He's got all the relationships, okay? Um, and if you compare him to Stefan Dedalus in Ulysses by James Joyce, um, uh, you know, which is the prototypical modern character. And Joyce said he really respected the character he drew there because he uh, was a father, a son, a brother, all these things. You know, there were people like that in, involved in Stefan's life, and and uh, he was a well-rounded character. Well, you know, same with Odysseus. Okay, he's modern in this too, and the psyche of Stefan Daedalus and the psyche of Odysseus are the same. The same angsts, the same disturbances of soul plague both of them, and. Uh, Okay, uh, so uh, these are these are reasons why I was attracted to Odysseus. Not not the warfare. Uh, I, I just take a moment because people fixate on the warfare and uh, the violence, and um, that's for that's why I didn't pick the Iliad because personally I'd never been to war. Uh, I really don't know what it's like to kill somebody. I'm glad I don't. Um, I respect people that have, not not because I respect the damage to their psyche, and the ones that are thoughtful always approach it in that manner. They're not proud. They're they're worried, and so I know I'd worry too. I wouldn't be proud of it. I'd be I'd be horrified at what I had to do. So I don't have an experience of, of that deep warfare. So I wanted something else. I've done a lot of traveling. I've spent a lot of time in strange places with 
people way different than me and I'm way different than them and it's a delight for me I have no problem in those situations I fit in I think pretty well wherever I go uh, dirt floor hut or you know big old nice hotel I don't care I can get on anywhere and I like that um, so anyway um, uh, I picked, I picked the book four and and the Odyssey because it's not primarily about war, okay. And um, although there's a lot of war in it, and uh, but there's other things, and that would give me greater scope and to say the things I wanted to say. Um, there's a danger to Odysseus that's very subtle, though. And I boy, I got this when I was young. I did. I really clocked this when I was quite young. And, if you follow an Odysseus in your life, uh, you just might cheat yourself out of your own homecoming to help him achieve his. And I think this says something foundational about our attitudes in following leaders. And people who live in democracies should be good team players. I am fully believe that. I don't think they should be very good followers, okay? You can be a darn good team player. You don't have to be a follower. And I think the experience of Odysseus's crew, nary a one of them gets home. They all help him, the leader, get home. I think this was a subtle message that Homer wove into the story uh, that uh, is profound. If you think about it, because you, boy, you love Odysseus. You think, oh man, if I could just sail with Odysseus. You give up your homecoming to do that. And the Greeks, I think, were smart enough to know this. They knew this. They could admire Odysseus on the one hand, and they realized, no, nah, you don't follow an Odysseus. That burden is for you to take upon your own shoulders. You should follow nobody but yourself. But you should be a good team player, too. Nobody said life's easy or uncomplicated. Okay, so... Uh, I decided that's why I'm doing Odysseus book four, okay? Um, oh, the Odyssey, I'm sorry. Now, uh, I just want to say right now, this is a poem, okay? And it was composed as a poem originally, an oral composition. Now, for me, you know, I wrote it like, you know, you would normally experience a poet, okay? I mean, I was outside in a nice way. I like to be outside. Uh, I do better outside. Uh, uh, but, you know, I'm alone and I'm contending with the page and I'm crumpling paper and all that kind of thing. You know, that, that's how I composed it. However, originally these compositions were composed publicly, orally, as a performance. And uh, I wasn't going to be able to do it that way. But, uh, you know, I wanted to, I, you know, I wanted to give a flavor of that. So as I as I went through and I'm translating the thing, I thought, okay, you know, the prose uh, version it fell flat on my ear. So I thought, what the heck? Do it in poetry. It's in dactylic hexa dac uh, dactylic hexameter, um, which is totally artificial for English speech. You can't maintain it. It's very difficult to write it or to write a good line in dactylic hexameter in English. It's just, it's not our prosody. Uh, but iambic pentameter is, so I resorted to iambic pentameter, which is Marlowe's Mighty Line. Um, it's a powerful piece. It's a powerful way to write poetry. Uh, Shakespeare bought it hook, line, and sinker. All of his plays are iambic pentameter. When it's ten syllable, they call it blank verse. Um, a lot of people say, well, it's not perfect. You know, there's very, he varied it in places so it wouldn't get boring. Uh, uh, a linguist by the name of, of Otto Jesperson, I think he worked back in the 30s, he wrote on this subject and he really did a very scientific view of uh, iambic pentameter in Shakespeare. And uh, he found a passage, and I sure wish, I think it was in Merchant of Venice, but I don't remember exactly. But he said there's over 60 lines of perfect iambic pentameter, follows the pattern, the, the syllable count, everything. And he read that very carefully because he wanted to see if, the, you know, if, it, if it did become boring and 
stultified by um, uh, uh, you know too rigid an adherence to the form and he read through it and he became very familiar with the passage and he didn't think so at all it was very natural it had a, a rapidity a nobility a uh, clarity uh, to quote Matthew Arnold's uh, uh, assessment of uh, Homer's uh, poetry and um, so did so did Shakespeare's iambic pentameter it had these things, and uh, it didn't become boring. It, it really fell on the ear nicely. It had rhythm. It had a, it, a natural speech uh, pattern almost. Um, you could hardly tell it was poetry, but you go, you know, hey, there's something there. It's boy, it's eloquent. Well, this is what helped do it. So uh, I thought, what the heck, iambic pentameter, very good. Um, but uh, Okay, so as I went back, I you know I got to a, I got to this passage in book four where uh, it's his most dire moment I think in his entire life if you want to look at it that way. Uh, he's been he's just left Calypso's Isle. He's on a raft. Uh, Poseidon's coming back from Ethiopia and sees Odysseus uh, down in the ocean getting away. Now Odysseus has blinded his Cyclops monster son Polyphemus. Polyphemus made a prayer to Poseidon, you know, make it hard on this guy. If you can't kill him, harm him all you can. So Poseidon says, sure, son. And he sees Odysseus on his raft there and hits him with a storm. And uh, Odysseus uh, ends up in the water swimming on his own. Now, Eno has come by and given him her headband, and that's his magical help to make it through this terrible ordeal. Uh, because uh, I don't know if you could survive two nights and three days in the ocean with just swimming. I don't know. Don't know if you could. But anyway, with Eno's headband, Odysseus was able to. And he's clinging to a, a, some flotsam and jetsam occasionally, too. So anyway, he's saying, but I'm thinking, okay, uh, let's uh, looking at this, you know, a little bit realistically and, and placing myself in that situation. And, and I think we've all, you know, watched Lifeboat movies, you know, Lifeboat with uh, Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, uh, you know, you wonder what did that, what would that be like floating alone in the open ocean like that? Yeah, we've all wondered about that. There've been enough movies on that subject. Um, and so, of course, you'd, re you'd, you'd review your life and you'd go, why me? What did I do to deserve such a fate? I think it's just natural. So, um, you know, I thought, well, what the heck? Do that. And the first thing that I realized was Homer omitted a lot of Odysseus's life. He's got a lot of adventures that Homer is silent upon in the Odyssey. Uh, he tells a lot, of course, but boy, he misses out a lot. So I thought, okay, well, here's an opportunity for me to bring it all together into one package, one easily acceptable package. And I wanted to do that because I didn't know his biography in such detail. So that was fun. And then as I, as I came to use the supporting mythology to beef up the story and show uh, and to um, uh, clarify other characters, uh, I realized that there's not Greek myths. There's only Greek myth. It's one story of which there's many threads and all of them are connected to all the others. That's what's cool. So I gained a new appreciation of Greek mythology and realized that it's a vast single story. It's all connected genealogically, historically, events, the whole thing. It's really just one story. It's got a beginning, middle and end. You know, it starts with the creation of the world and it ends with Odysseus returning home. And that's really, that's the, that, that's one story. It really is one story. La, it's a thick story, very wide, lots of, lots of, lots of threads in there, but it's an incredible tapestry. So that was fun. And I tried to bring some of that out in, in my writing. So, uh, Odysseus, the epic myth of the heroes is a, uh, is a pretty good primer in Greek mythology in general. Okay. Um, okay. Now, after I finished writing this up, uh, it was uh, I had it in a cool black binder. It's all written in pencil. Uh, it's all written out there, and 
uh, you know, I just it just sat around for a while, but I, I did make an effort to get it published, which was mostly met with polite bafflement. Not many people laughed directly in my face, mostly it was polite bafflement, but I had a few very sincere uh, people that I think took time and did read it a bit and just didn't dismiss it out of hand. And I was, I generally got this from that ilk of uh, critic. I it said it's a lovely idea. I'm just sorry to say that it has zero commercial chance. And so I thought, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I wasn't too dismayed. I, labor of love, I guess that's what it was, and I don't regret it for a minute. So, uh, but it wasn't going to get published. Uh, and then I'm sorry to say that the, uh, the uh, binder got stolen. Darn, all my original work was stolen, but I had typed it up on computer and, uh, you know, I had printed it out by that time. And uh, But the original that I hand wrote, uh, I'm sorry to say that that binder got stolen. So, um, time went on. Uh, I remarried, divorced and remarried. Sad to say I divorced, but then I remarried. And uh, when I met Annika, you know, bragging to the new girl, you know, well, I wrote a book, you know. <laughs> and she says, well, read it to me. Because she's very, she likes to listen. Okay, she she she's visual and oral at the same time. So I read it out loud to her, and uh, I honestly felt well. There were two things. She didn't like not knowing the names, so I made an effort when I rewrote it for publication that I made sure every name is accounted for. Uh, you get a sense of who they are when I use it. I don't. Okay, so. Uh, this is in response to Anik, and I made a book, better book of it for that, and a um, better poem for it. And then um, we, um, uh, I, I sensed in her interest that it was more than just, hey, I like this guy, and, you know, hey, I have to like what, I have to like his, his poem, too. Uh, I did, because she asked very penetrating, good questions about it, and helped me write a better book for it, you know? And um, uh, so then we, you know, we went through this whole thing of, of self-publishing, and it was very cool. I put the cover up here one more time. We spent a joyful, doggone Saturday doing this cover together, and it was a real fun experience because we, you know, we messed with the photograph and we worked on the type. She bought this typeface. It's called Waldorf Schrieff. Really beautiful typeface. Uh, type. Uh, there's no two letters exactly the same. They're all individual a bit, although it's a it's a font, uh, lovely. So uh, uh, we 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 brought that together, and, and boy, we realized that uh, you know we we work really well together. We're good friends. We're rapidly on the way to becoming best friends. And uh, uh, so I married up the, with this girl, and. Uh, she, uh, we're still best friends. So it was, it was that, you know, I think I, I really realized it working on the cover. Very, very enjoyable experience. Very memorable. Up in Cambria, sitting in my living room, looking out the window, and, you know, that was nice. Pines in the sea. Okay, uh, last thing I'll say is that th this thing is uh, uh, written to be read aloud. I am very sensitive to that. I can't be an epic bard. <laughs> That, that, that would have been fun, you know, to be, uh, to be a griot in, in old Africa or to be a, 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 a goosely player in old Yugoslavia. These guys that, uh, you know, grow up in the epic traditions. Demodocus, blind Demodocus in the, uh, the Odyssey, another epic bard. Uh, really, they're schools, okay, and you really learn your poetry. You uh, learn the ligaments. And then you're able to, you know, assemble these ligaments into any shape you want, and that's the beauty of these things. They were they were orally composed on the spot uh, in response to who the audience was. The singer would always know who the audience was. Know your audience, of course, and they could uh, modify the tale any way they wanted. They could make up new tales. Although they, they didn't, they stuck to traditional stuff. They were for the most part, but they were uh, they were able to do this, and um, so they, it was it was extemporous, extemporaneous um, uh, composition, and uh, you know like a good jazz musician can play uh, can improvise 
you know, they know their scales. Okay, they know their scales. Jazz guys, they know their scale. They know their chords. They know their scales. And they use those things to extemporize. So you're thinking, oh my God, that's all brand new. It is, but when you ask them, they're saying, well, I know my scales, man. I know which scale goes with which chord. And so it's the same thing with these epic bards. They had heroic epithets, the wine dark sea, and they knew the line length. They were very sensitive to line length, and they knew, well, I got to stick in a wine dark sea to finish this line. And they were very practiced at it, but it sounded spontaneous at the time. Well, I couldn't do that, okay? I'm not in that tradition. I'm in a Western poetry tradition. And I'm looking back on our grandfathers and how they did things. And I tried to do my best to bring as much as I could. And so I'll end this by saying that the methods of composition differ between me and these old epic bards. Uh, but uh, the end products, are uh, they have affinity for each other, I would hope. So you know, with that, I'm going to read it out loud. And I'm going to post it on a, uh, uh, a certain basis on YouTube. And it's got to be a half hour. And I was trying to make it shorter than that. Anyway... Uh, thank you very much for listening, and I and I hope you will uh, uh, go and listen to uh, Odysseus, the epic myth of the hero. Uh, and uh, I'm going to go read the preface to you right now. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs>